this is an opportunity to take a picture. Okay, so I'm going to present the case of a 78 year old retired lady who was a keen dog walker. And she presented to us in 2008, feeling generally unwell with hyponatremia, a low cortisol and abnormal thyroid function tests. She had an MRI of her head that showed a pituitary macroadenoma, which is shown here, and she had normal visual fields. As a consequence, she was started onto thyroxine and hydrocortisone. She was regularly followed up and she had two yearly MRI scans, um, which initially showed a reduction in her pituitary tumour and then the um, tumour stabilised out. Eight years after her original presentation, her GP performed a DEXA scan um, and the DEXA scan showed osteoporosis at the lumbar spine. So my first question is, what would you do now? So how many of you would do an SST at this point and how many think that there is no need for an SST? Just move to mentally close, um, but slight majority that the SST is not needed. Okay, so we opted to do an SST. So later that year, she had a short synaclin test, which showed a good, healthy and robust cortisol response. And based on that, her steroids were stopped. Just over a year later, she had a routine appointment, which showed that she was adequately replaced on her thyroxine and that she had um, a good morning cortisol and normal sodium at 141. Now, seven months after that, she presented to A&E. She presented with nausea, weight loss, and she'd newly been commenced onto omeprazole. Her blood showed a hyponatremia, normal renal function. Her blood osmolality was 246, so on the dilute side. Urine osmolality was very concentrated at 544, and her urine sodium was 99. So my next question is, what is the diagnosis? So is it a drug-induced hyponatremia, SIADH, psychogenic polydipsia, or we can't tell? So just moving. Okay, so if you can get voting, Okay, great, so I'm just going to unhide now. Okay, so a mix of answers with the majority saying that you can't tell at this stage, uh, followed closely by SIADH, which is understandable to think that it is SIADH, in fact, because the biochemistry looks very suspicious of that. But the key point here is the importance of having all the information before you make a judgment. So take this picture, for instance, it looks quite alarming when you first look at it. But if I add in one key piece of missing information, which is the TV screen, then it completely changes um, our interpretation of what we see. And that's very similar for interpretation of urine osmolality, serum osmolalities and urine sodium. They really have to be seen within the correct context and with all the information. So, in, so things that we need to consider would be the cortisol, the thyroid function, and the glucose levels. But if we look at something and think that it's SIADH, but we haven't actually looked at the cortisol level, then we can't really at that point call it SIADH, because if the cortisol levels are very low, which they were in the case of this lady, her cortisol levels were found to be less than 28, um, then this is not at this point a true SIADH. But what is it that makes a low cortisol look so much like SIADH biochemically? Well, we don't actually know the mechanism at the moment, but there are some animal studies which hypothesize that it's to do with aquaporins. So aquaporins are water channels. They're found in many cells of the body, but primarily cells that are involved in the transport of water. So cells found in the kidney, for instance. Many different types of aquaporin channel exist, so aquaporin 3, aquaporin 4, but the one we're interested in today is aquaporin 2. So here's a diagram 
of um, the kidneys. So here's the renal tubule shown in yellow, yellow urine with water there, the renal epithelial cell and the blood in red. And attached to the renal epithelium is the V2 receptor. So in the blood you have ADH and ADH binds to the V2 receptor. Within the renal epithelium, um, that's where aquaporin 2 is housed. And with binding of ADH, the aquaporin 2 binds to the interface with the renal tubule and the renal epithelium. So when water passes through the renal tubule, some of it will pass through the aquaporin 2 channel into the cell, through the aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4 channels and into the blood. And that's the way we think that water is transported from the renal tubule into the blood. Once ADH has done its job, then the aquaporin 2 doesn't need to remain bound. So bits of it fall off and are washed away in the urine and other bits of it are recycled for future use. And this path of recycling is thought to be steroid dependent. So if you don't have enough steroid, then you don't recycle the aquaporin 2 channels, which means they remain bound. So water passes from the renal tubules, some of which, which will pass into the cell, through the other aquaporins and into the blood. Again, water passes through into the cell and into the blood, and that process repeats itself until you end up with concentrated urine and dilute blood, which looks a lot like SIADH biochemically, but actually there is no excess of ADH there, and it's in fact due to not having enough steroid. So back to our lady, she presents 10 years after her original presentation with an apparent SIADH. Uh, the next day we discover that she's uh, cortisol and steroid deficient. So she started on to steroids and this is what happens. So here's a graph of her urinosmolality, and she starts on the 7th of August at a urinosmolality of around 550, so very concentrated. We start prednisolone 4 milligrams. You can see here that she's now able to clear her free water, so she dilutes her urine right down to 100, and then it picks up very slightly after that. And similarly, her urine sodium starts off at 100. We start the prednisolone, and it drops right down to 20. So moving on to her scans, this is her um, routine surveillance scan performed in August 2015. And this is her scan 2008 when she presented, here's her large pituitary macroadenoma. It then changed and shrunk and stabilized out by 2015. And then three years later in 2018, it's grown again. So things have changed. Now we are no strangers to change. So we've seen dramatic changes occur over the course of a few years. We've seen dramatic changes occur even in the course of a few months. And change can happen clinically too. So in this lady in 2008, she had a large macroadenoma and was steroid deficient. So we started steroids. Eight years later, she had a normal steroid axis. So we stopped steroids. And then two years after that, she was still, you know, had a good steroid um, axis, normal shrunken MRI. Um, and seven months after that, her tumour had grown, she had become steroid deficient um, and we restarted steroids. So things can change, change can happen and change can happen slowly and quickly. And my final concluding point is about seeing, but not always believing too readily when it comes to SIADH. So here is her biochemistry, which is very suggestive of SIADH when you take it um, on the face of things. Um, but the diagnosis really needs to be made in the context of other factors. So things that can give you a clue, fluid status, but rather confusingly, she was actually euvolemic. The context is important, so this is a lady who previously had a macroadenoma, previously needed steroids, but things such as medication make a difference, and finally you can do direct blood measurements of things like cortisol, thyroid function and glucose. And differentiating between SIADH and steroid deficiency is not just academic, the treatment is very, very different. If you were to treat somebody with steroid deficiency, uh, uh, as SIADH, then it could be potentially dangerous. 
Um, so thank you very much for listening and we welcome any questions. Great, thank you. Now there might be some questions. I'm going to just try and uh, explain and I'll just share my screen um, to see if anyone has got uh, any answers to the mechanisms. Yes, we it certainly reinforce the point about not uh, believing the uh, the SST. Um, let me show you some evidence first of all for and some very old evidence. I'll come back to the QR code in a second. Okay, so so this business about being only deficient in cortisol affecting free water clearance has been known about for a long time. So this is from 1951. Okay, this is in the days before we had an assay for cortisol. Okay, we could only measure urine volumes and urine sodiums and things. And this is the the first uh, study. It was a single patient about where they gave a liter of water to a man with Addison's disease, and you can see that when he has a liter of water, his urine output doesn't really increase. Okay, and this is over uh, the day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. And so it looks like he's unable to clear free water. Then they did the same thing. They did have cortisone, this was in 1951. So cortisone had been available since about 1945. And here they give him cortisone. Um, where's my mouse? There it is. They give him cortisone in the morning at about nine. And then they give him one liter of water and immediately he clears it. Okay, so if you look at this is the cortisone given at 9 a.m. And then they wait for about four hours and then they give him some water and he pees it all out. So like all of us, if you drink a litre of water, you will clear a litre of water within a few hours. But notice that if you gave the cortisone and the litre of water at the same time, at noon, then there is no water clearance for some hours until the cortisone has its effect and then the delayed water clearance. So this put together in this one person was the first evidence that you needed cortisone to clear free water. And that went to the Lancet in 1951. In okay, so case there's a delay of two hours for the cortisone to do something, whereas if you give the cortisone early morning, it's then much quicker. So um, this is similar to Rashika's slide and shows exactly the same thing. And the bit I'm talking about here is that this is the bit that seems to be steroid dependent. And it's very hard to find the evidence for this, but I've dug around and uh, this is the best I can find. Okay, this is a molecular analysis of impaired urine dilution capacity in st uh, steroid deficiency or glucorticoid. Now what they did was they took rats, of course you can't listen to humans, uh, but I'll show you some human data in a minute. So they took some basically uh, glucocorticoid deficient rats and they did that by removing both adrenals, okay? And then one group, the deficient group, got only aldosterone and the control group got both aldosterone and dexamethasone. And that was fully replaced, okay? So to summarize, the controls had no adrenals but were replaced with aldosterone and dexamethasone and the glucocorticoid deficient rats were only given aldosterone they were for deficient in essentially in cortisol. And to summarize their findings, okay, these are the tubules stained for aquaporin 2. Now, as you saw in Rashika's slide, I'll just go back a couple. Aquaporin 2 is this protein here that is stored inside the cell. And when ADH arrives here, it pushes these vesicles so that the pumps end up in the membrane immediately. So you drink some water, you suppress the ADH, and therefore this should come off. And this bit coming off is dependent on um, steroids. Okay, and what they found was in the control animals, um, there was aquaporin 2 everywhere, but in the still deficient animals, you can see the increased stain on the inside. Okay, in other words, the um, aquaporin 2s were still stuck to the inside, and therefore that explains really why you need steroids to clear free water. Okay, because if these things are stuck on the inside, that's the lumen, then um, you're going to get pumps the water pump will continue even um, when the patient has, um, has lots of ADH, okay? So, so the ADH, the AVP, will basically push these proteins into the membrane and the cortisol should remove them. So when you've got no cortisol, you can't clear free water. And I'll just tell you about another condition when you might need to know about this, and that's in a condition called neurosarcoid, where a patient might have both no ACTH and no ADH because, of course, 
the sarcoid tissue is in the hypothalamus and it takes out ADH and it takes out ACTH. So you get deficiency of both. Now those patients are sometimes diagnosed with chest sarcoid first. They have a normal sodium or maybe a slightly low sodium, okay? And what they have is central diabetes insipidus that's caused by no ADH masked by lack of cortisol. And interestingly, because they often diagnose the chest sarcoid first, they give them prednisolone replacement, okay? Quite high dose, not replacements, uh, therapy doses. And what basically happened is the patient suddenly develops diabetes insipidus, okay? So to summarize, the patient had no ACTH and no ADH. They treated the sarcoid with steroids, and this is what happened. So this is when the patient was started on high dose hydrocortisone, um, and you can see this is in the volume, okay, of urine. And you can see that just with steroids, a big jump up, okay, in the um, water output. And then there's a big jump up in the plasma sodium. So you can see that DI has become apparent. And then when they give the patient to depressin as well, it came back down. So this is the evidence that you can unmask DI. And that's because you need cortisol to remove that aquaporin 2 from the inner membrane. So you unmask your diabetes insipidus. And that's why the patient also needs vasopressin. So if there's no ADH, you can't put the protein in the membrane. And if there's no steroid, you can't um, get them out. Now, I'll just show you one other thing from an old textbook. Uh, this is my father's textbook in 1965. They had no acid for cortisol. But based on that case I mentioned a minute ago, um, this is how you diagnose Addison's disease in 1965. The only thing you can measure are the 17 ketosteroids in the urine. They had no assay for cortisol. But what they do is measure everything on the right-hand side of the 17. So you get all this stuff in the urine and you'd measure. And the major player, of course, is cortisol, okay? Because this enzyme activates all of these. But cortisol is measured in nanomoles, 300, 400 nanomoles. Testosterone, maybe 10 nanomoles, estrogen in picomoles. So the major player of the 17 steroids are cortisol in the, in the plasma and in the urine. So here is the initial 1965 short synaptin test, okay? They measure the urinary cortico-17 steroids. They measure the level in the blood. This is a normal person making ACTH. They gave the patient some extra 25 units of ACTH over eight hours. That was the first study. And they found a nice rise in the urine ketosteroid, okay? Then they take a patient with Addison's disease, do it again no rise in urine steroids, okay? It stays flat when they gave the patient some intravenous ACTH. So they had ACTH, but no assay for cortisol. And then they've diagnosed here in a pituitary patient, they do the same thing. This is the birth of the long synaptin test, okay? Where you give the patient an infusion, okay? Uh, eight out over four days. And you can see, whereas the Addison's patient had no rise in cortisol, the pituitary patient had a slow and gradual improvement in adrenal function as they got recovery. So I just want to show you this last bit, okay? And then we'll call it a day, we're 10 minutes over. So this is the test for Addison's. And what they do, is do a blood test for sodium potassium, okay? Here's normal, here's Addison's disease. And they say it's severe, sodium 130, potassium six. And then they take this patient, and this is the test for Addison's disease. It's called the water load test, okay? Great, isn't it? So they take this patient, nil by mouth, they give him one and a half liters of water to drink, over 15 minutes from 7.45 to 8 a.m. This is the this is the book how to do it, okay? And here is what will happen. You've got a normal adrenal gland. You basically have enough cortisol and you clear all that free water. So five hours later, you pee 1,000 mils. That is normal. If you had Addison's disease, the definition of Addison's disease was a patient who could clear less than one liter of the 1,500 mils, okay? And that meant you have got not enough cortisol. They then gave the patient, because they had cortisol, 100 milligrams of cortisol and repeat the test and lo and behold they now clear that free water so this proves that the patient is deficient in cortisol and it can be replete and that's the water test and that has come about basically because of the aquaporin 2 mechanism so it's been known but it's not a new thing uh, so but bear in mind the mechanism clear because people think that it's due to um, some other um, correction like vasopressin, but in fact it's not. It's actually an effect of cortisol on the ability of the kidney to clear free water, okay? And that's because of this bit here. 
Okay, we're just at 4.15, so I'm going to call it a day and say thank you all very much. If you've got any questions, please type them in. There are quite a few questions I saw about steel replacement. We'll cover that on a different day, but just a couple of things. The cutoff, one of the viewers say was very keen on the cutoff of 500 or 550, and the problem is that while you say in this patient it was 550, we would have not stopped the steroid. If we give everybody who hits 550 or less than 550 steroids, we're going to be giving, making a lot of people cushing oil. And one of the things that I'm very keen on making sure that you all know is that we used to over-treat people with steroids for years. We've given too many people too much steroid, and that's got to stop because we all thought, oh, it's okay, give it extra steroids, harmless, but it's not harmless. It causes all the complications of Cushing's, okay? So we need to minimize that dose. And you can either, as you heard earlier, give maybe 10, 5, 5 hydrocortisone, or as some of you know, I'm very keen on prednisolone because you can give really low doses. And it seems we need to do a, get a bit more data on randomized controlled trials. Um, but it's possible that that will enable us to give lower doses of steroid safely in a replacement manner. Okay, let me see if I...